Coming up on this week's show, a video game started in 1982 has finally been finished. The new Mario movie trailer has landed. And we go on a tech tangent with our guest, Shelby. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our good pals at Bitmap Books. Now, something you should check out, and we'll tell you more about this in just a bit, the secret history of Mac gaming, the new expanded edition, exploring the Mac's overlooked legacy as a gaming platform. You can check that out on the rest of their retro gaming books right now on their website at bitmapbooks.com. And with our friends at PCBWay, who offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service. They have low cost, fast turnaround quality boards, and they offer new services like 3D printing and injection molding. And they're massive supporters of the retro community, as I'm sure you know. So get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 348, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Of course, a podcast that every Friday takes you on a nostalgic trip back in time reminiscing about the golden age of video games and technology, bringing you up to speed on all the happenings in the world of retro, and of course, bringing you a special guest on the show each week. And I'll tell you more about our guest this week, who is incredible in just a moment. But actually, when the show lands, you and I, Ravi, will be uh, on a jet plane, heading over to a massive Amiga event that's going to be happening in Germany this weekend. Yeah, it's really a, a busy time for events. We've just seen uh, lots of video footage and stuff of people at Play Expo, and they seem to have a really good time there. And, you know, it, it's just amazing that video game events are coming back again. And this one's very special because, uh, for me, I used to go to these big 90s Amiga shows, and uh, Dan didn't used to go to them. You know, he never, he never went to the huge crazy mm. ones like world of amiga but now in germany it's uh the amiga 37 event and my god they've sold over a thousand tickets i didn't know there were that many amiga lovers in the world because <laughs> you and i went to this event before covid didn't win 2019 yeah and i remember then it wasn't like the local tv station covering it because people were queuing around the corner to get into this venue it was like going to what i imagine an Amiga event in like 1993 must have been like. Yeah, it, it's definitely starting to have that vibe. And like, you know, Amiga kept going in Germany because of like companies like SCOM and stuff. And it was really still popular. And there's a whole like demo scene there. But a lot of people come over from Europe, uh, all over the place, really. And uh, there's a big American group this time coming. So, you know, it's going to be pretty amazing. I, I, I just think the whole place is going to get overwhelmed with amigas and floppy disks <laughs> yeah it's it's going to be really good fun i'm really excited about it and i'm going to be uh dropping some tunes on the uh amiga decks as well which uh, should be good fun yeah so look out for um obviously we'll talk about it next week on the podcast but if you are coming out there this weekend um just near dusseldorf to amiga 37 um we will hopefully see you there It'd be nice to see uh, a few familiar faces and um you know it's always nice when listeners come over and introduce themselves and say hello isn't it I like, yeah i like how you didn't pronounce the time now, uh, town name because it's quite hard <laughs> go on then ravi um go on say it munchen gladback i think i think i've actually got it right i've been working on it um and uh, <laughs> that's just gonna add loads of comments from german listeners like no it's <laughs> total wrong pronunciation and i'm gonna be flying out at eight o'clock on friday morning so i've realized to get there to heathrow in time from nottingham i've got to leave here at about 2 a.m Oh so gosh, hopefully hardcore. I'm going to be yeah. <laughs> reasonably awake on Friday night and we'll get it, have a get-together. So if you're coming out this weekend, it will be great to see you there. Uh, and of course, we've got lots of new stories to talk about. I know you're chomping at the bit to talk about the Mario trailer, Joe. <laughs> is it going to be as good as the original Mario movie that everyone else in the world thinks is dreadful, but is your favourite film of all time? <laughs> it's not It's not going to be as good as it. There we go. Let's move on. <laughs> Where's Bob Hoskins? <laughs> oh, <laughs> No, you're making him sad now. Uh, but we have got a guest who's going to be covered up on the show as well in around half an hour from now. And, uh, you know, we, we bring you all kinds of guests on this show, but I do really enjoy it when we talk to like-minded other content creators. And this week, I was really pleased to be able to talk to Shelby, who's a YouTuber who runs a channel called Tech Tangents. Now, he's been one of my favourite YouTubers for probably about four or five years now. He, he's been on YouTube since about 2011. But really, his channel's only kind of blown up since around 2018 when he did a video 
building his ultimate Windows 98 rig. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, but most people probably have, being that it's on almost 7 million views, that video now. Uh, yeah, I did actually see that one. And um, it's pretty interesting because I want to do a, a Windows 98 rig as well. And some of the stuff on his channel is amazing. Dan, this is a channel that you, you have been on about for so long. You, you really do rate it. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing this interview. I tried to make it, but I was trapped on the bus so uh, Dan's <laughs> doing this one solo because uh, of the traffic. God damn it. No, because Shelby's channel, he covers all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, he started on that Windows 98 video that really made him, you know, well known. But I mean, he's been doing stuff like, you know, um, exploring 70s microcomputers like the IMSI 8080 that was, you know, the computer that David Lightman used in war games. Um, he also does stuff on there like, you know, mini computers. He's re repaired the first ever CD-ROM drive on his channel recently as one of his most popular videos he's done in recent weeks. He covers like, you know, scuzzy devices and calculators, a lot of classic calculators on his channel as well, that really is completely up my street. So um, I sat down with Shelby virtually um, to talk to him for an hour. And I've got to say that hour just completely flew by. I could have done like three or four hours with him. So um, I'm going to get proper geeky with him. You're going to really enjoy our special guest, Shelby from the channel Tech Tangents, coming up on the show in around half an hour from now. But of course, before that, Every week on the podcast, we bring you up to speed on the headlines from the world of retro over the last week, and lots of news to jump straight into this week, including it is finally here. What is this place? Chris Pratt as Mario, who I remember reading an, an interview with him about six months ago, and he said, my voice as Mario is going to blow your mind. To me, it just sounds like Chris Pratt in every other movie. I was going to say, wasn't the quote, I mean, I don't know it word for word, but he also said, um, it's like nothing you've ever heard before. Or other people said, <laughs> it's like nothing you've ever heard before. And I'm just like, it's just Chris Pratt. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think We've it's lost lot every single element of any, any Italianness in there. Um, like, you know, it, Italian vibe. He could have gone with the New York Italian kind of, vibe it's, and uh, i don't really like that to be honest i think I, um mario's an italian plumber come on yeah. yeah i think it's it's that fine line of like you know kind of upsetting anybody and then also mm. you know trying to stay true to the source material but i think bottom line you know i i i know chris pratt people either hate him or love him i really like him as star lord in the marvel films but other than that, I don't. I don't think I've enjoyed any. I think he's films. overused. Like yeah. I liked him in Parks and Rec and stuff like that. But I think he's on yeah. everything. Nowadays, I've not. I've not actually it? watched Parks and Rec, but I have heard that that is a fantastic show, and he's really good in that, um, and he's really funny in it. But yeah, you know. What, in terms well, of, what else did you think of the other trailers and the graphics and stuff and the kind of storyline? I think. I think graphically, I think it looks good. Obviously, it's no Bob Hopkins movie. Uh, with Brad, you know, is that good or bad? <laughs> it's, pro it's probably a good thing for everybody else, bad thing for me. But I think well, being that he passed away nearly a decade yeah, ago, I, I guess know, it was a bit I know, that's why I was like, oh, Ravi, earlier on. <laughs> um, I think they've captured Toad's voice really well. I can't remember which one it, it, it is. It's from one of the one of them from Key and Peel. I totally didn't know uh, Bob Hoskins passed away. I'm upset now. Oh, sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> bit behind on the news, though. Yeah, yeah Keegan Michael Key, you mean? Yeah, that's it. That's his name. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, I think he's nailed uh, Toad really well. Didn't quite catch Luigi, um, but it, I forget it. I forgot his name as well. But it's the guy from um, Toy Sunny in Philadelphia, isn't it? Bowser, Jack Black. People are loving it. Like I've seen articles saying Jack Black has nailed it and all this. I didn't actually like Bowser's voice. <laughs> um, I had more of an issue with Bowser's voice than I did with um, with Mario's voice. You know, with Chris Pratt. I didn't really. My only issue with Chris Pratt's voice is it's just Chris Pratt. It's you know it, sh it should have been Charles Mario. How do you say it? Charles Marionette? You know the the, the original yeah. Mario voice actor. It should have been him. Bottom line. I although, although I'm looking at the cast now on IMDb. He says he's in it. He is credited on that. He's credited yeah, but, on but, there. Also, have you seen the French trailer? So no, we've got a French trailer which has a different voice, and it does sound more like Mario. Yeah, it's I've, got I've, that Italian little vibe as well. Yeah, I've heard that. That does sound more like Mario. Like people are saying they're going to watch the French version with yeah, subtitles. Yeah, French and stuff. with subtitles. Yeah. Um, I'm going to learn French just to <laughs> yeah, watch it. It's more. Yeah, um, but you know, is, is there an Italian version? Surely that would be more logical. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There probably will be. Um, but I think the trailer overall, 
Um, it looks fine. I think, you know, the bottom line is it, it looks fine. And they haven't, for me, and they haven't had as much hate as the original <laughs> Sonic trailer did. To, to me, Mario doesn't look like a man. He looks like a man-child hybrid. <laughs> like what did a you bit say? More, did you say he looks he, like he a also cat? Looks, he looks like a cat, but there's also yeah. Cat Mario that came out. And maybe in my head, I'm associating him <laughs> You're with just associating them two together. Um, yeah, but uh, he does look pretty kid-like. But, uh, yeah, yeah, and you know, I think I, I was half expect because everybody was just like, there was loads of hype because Nintendo posted the poster like a week, maybe a couple of days before the trailer landed. And like people were like, oh, our first look at Mario from behind. You know, we all wonder what his face is going to look like. And I was just a bit like, oh, he's just going to be Mario, isn't he? They're not going to change. Like in the games. In the, in the, in the modern games. The modern, the graphics on the modern, modern games will pass for CGI in a film, surely. But obviously mm. they have changed the look of him a little bit, which, like Ravi says, I think it's a bit of an odd direction because it's like, are they trying to make him look more human because of, Obviously, he doesn't look like a real human. Still. Or were they going for that, like um, Wreck It Ralph kind of? Um, yeah, a lot uh, of people uh, are saying like, it looks like Fix It know. Felix yeah. from Wreck It Ralph, mm. um, which I can also see. Um, I thought it was funny the trailer. I thought yeah, it, it had like funny, cute elements and stuff, and you can see yeah, yeah, how the, the characters are going to stick out, and it's aimed for kids as well. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Look, looking yeah. beyond any sort of like negative pre force I've got by or whatever, you know, being serious. It comes back to it looked fine i'll probably enjoy it i just i didn't like bowser's voice very much but i think that's just because there's so much focus on everybody's voices and i think there's so much media hype and potential negativity surrounding the fact that the film is coming out that there is going to be a mario oh, film. It's, it's it's harder to release it like it's, uh yeah. these days but also yeah. like you know back then it was a bit more aimed at adults the um uh original mario Do you reckon kind of one well, wow, that was a bit, that was a few <laughs> like, oh, bits yeah. in it, you know. And uh, yeah, do, do you remember? Do you remember Goomba in the original one? Yeah. That will give me nightmares for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, I think when there might served. be there might be a lot of double jokes in there or tongue in cheek kind of ones in the new one. I don't know, or it might just go totally fun kids vibe. Yeah, right, you know. Yeah, I'm interested to see um, Donkey Kong and Cranky Kong. You know how that works with them being in there, and it's Seth Rogen, isn't it? Donkey Kong is. Mm, yeah. Um, don't know if I'm looking forward to that or not. I can, I can, I can take or leave. You know, Seth Rogen. Some films, I think he's. Great. Is he going to be a stoner? Is he? Gonna yeah, I was going to say. I don't think I've ever seen a Seth Rogen film without. <laughs> you know, I, I being think, forced I think on you that was, there was one where he said he's never, he's never not been stoned when doing a film. So yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's, even, that, that would be interesting. Um, Charlie Day is the voice of Luigi. There we go. Um, oh, but he's very good in Sunny in Philadelphia, and he's got a kind of fun. Um, exciting, uh, confused voice as well. Okay. Yeah, so I think he, but he's he very, was, he's 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 very different. His voice, yeah, he, well. he'll probably suit that quite well. Um, but overall, from seeing the trailer, I mean, like I say, it's just my opinion. I'm not the voice of the people or anything like that. I think, I think it'll be fine. I think it'll be a decent film. I think it's probably the right direction to go in terms of like keeping people happy. We've only got, um, well, early next year, 7th of April, 2023, um, the release date for the new Mario movie. So I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty more trailers between and now and then. Plenty more controversies as well. Yeah, more than likely. Yeah. Now, what about this for an impressive video? We've seen Doom running on everything. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a joke now in the retro community, isn't it? What else is Doom going to run on? We've seen the pregnancy test. We've seen the fridge, the toaster. This is one, though, I think is actually one of the most impressive versions of Doom I've seen running even though this is actually running on a Windows PC. You might be thinking, well, what's so impressive about that? Someone's got Doom running inside Notepad. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. It's uh, running at 60 frames per second as well. And um, it is in Notepad. Now, the thing about this is it's not actually running in Notepad. Um, it's Notepad is used as a display. Right. So it's it's kind of using a, a function within the Windows API, which is taking the output of Doom. So I bet you he's got like Doom minimized or something in the background. And then it's converting it into a Unicode, which is, um, you know, the kind of text. It's, it's a lot like um, ASCII art or uh, Petsky or one of these kind of older, older languages, 
but it is running in it. So it is running a Notepad, though, yeah. It yeah, yeah, an everything. unmodified version of Notepad as well, but it is using this kind of translation layer that's within Windows to translate Doom directly into Notepad. So yeah, Notepad is the the, the display device basically. It's it's using like it's using Notepad as like the monitor or the output, you know. And I've seen similar things to this. I remember we were at, um, I think it was a retro computing museum in the Centre of Computing History in Cambridge. And the event we were at there one time, and I think the guys from the retro, retro computer museum in Leicester had a Commodore 64 set up and it was playing movies, but it would, they were being converted into um, Commodore 64 kind of ASCII or, or Petsky graphics on the fly. Yeah. So I imagine it's probably something like that. Well, it's, it's kind of like they're capturing the input, uh, they're, they're sending it to the app and the app's kind of taking screenshots and then remotely opening it in real time in, in Notepad and then kind of converting it into text as well. So, yeah, it's, it's a pre-made library code. So you could do this uh, with the API, and you could do this um, from any bitmaps, really. You could create that, but I do think it's really innovative. And it's like uh, just the kind of novelty of being able to run that. And, I, and I'm also a huge fan of ASCII art and, and text art mm. and stuff like that. I, I really love that, and it's, it's, it's good to see that coming out. And, like, you know, getting a bit of uh, attention there. And also, I'm a fan of Notepad. Like, I thought Notepad was wicked. I used to use that for my web coding, um, just using Notepad before people, you know, had a lot of these big editors and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just got that lovely connection between, you know, legacy computing and uh, and Doom, of course, running on it, which is just really nice. I've got to say as well, the speed of it, like you said, 60 frames a second, it kind of looks playable if you kind of squint your eyes and lean back from the monitor a bit. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, took, it took me a minute to kind of see it. I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's playable, personally. I can't see the enemies, <laughs> put it that way. And he says, you know, I'm not good at Doom. I think, you know, his gameplay skills are actually pretty decent considering what he's playing it on. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, it's just, it does kind of seem to be a bit of a benchmark now, you know, can it run Doom? And when it's running in stuff like this, I mean, I, I imagine it's one step from doing this to getting it running on like a a 1970s terminal or something next. I think <laughs> I think the only way you could do that would be cheating, though. So you, what you'd need to do is you'd need to have like something running Doom, like a Raspberry Pi, and then pump it into the terminal yeah. and use that as the kind of display device. I don't think it would have the computing grunt or power to do it. And um, yeah, obviously he's got, He's got Doom hidden somewhere, and he's kind of pumping it out to this. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see it natively done in, a, in, a, in an old 70s terminal. But uh, yeah, I think that would have to be a massive demake where it was just, you know, kind of like a basic 3D, 3D maze kind of engine. There's your job for next week, Ravi. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do it whilst I'm having a drink in uh, Germany. <laughs> Yeah, how did I do that next morning? <laughs> <laughs> Wake up with did it while you're on a, a notepad thing. Oh, a terminal, yeah. Well, speaking of uh, random fan remakes, how's that for a nice segue? Someone's actually remade Pokemon Yellow in Link's Awakening style 3D. So they've made this into a 3D game then, essentially, Pokemon Yellow. Yeah, so um, this comes from a YouTuber, uh, Pokebro. So they've said it's... Um, Link's Awakening style 3D, so the remake of Link's Awakening, which came out about two or three years ago now. I guess it's in a similar style, but graphically it isn't. It's in the same style as in they've taken a 2D pixel Game Boy game and made it a 3D Switch looking game. Um, so mm. don't get me wrong, I think this looks absolutely amazing. But the project was Pokebro gave himself two weeks to remake Pokemon Yellow, um, which oh, wow. is just insane. Now he hasn't made the entire game, but and he hasn't released it for obvious reasons because of Nintendo. Um, <laughs> but um, what he has made is perfectly playable and he's put out a five-minute video and it explains it really well how he's made it. So I know you guys aren't the biggest Pokemon. Oh, mate, this is completely my jam. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, this is like, yes, I love it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. he's made it in um, voxel art, which is like the 3D pixel art. And he started out with... <sighs> It's so so in the original Pokemon games, you know they're 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 very basic Japanese style JRPGs, and in this it seems a little bit more real time. So he's programmed it amazingly, 
and uh, he's made all the assets from scratch. He's completely made the game from scratch. You know, he's made your little main character, Ash Ketchum, you know, yellow, whatever you want to call him. Um, and then he's made Pikachu. And in, in the original Pokemon Yellow, Pikachu, you know, the novelty of it was Pikachu was out of his Pokeball following you, like in the TV the anime that had come out of the TV show. And <laughs> he's made it so well. So when you walk around, Pikachu is following you and he's like, he shows you how he's programmed it to like walk, uh, how Pikachu like follows you around and everything. But then if he sees another Pokemon rustling in the grass, he will like, if it comes into his sight, he will like run over and collide with it. So, and then they will start battling and you know, you, the game, it, they battle in real time rather than it changing to a battle, you know, screen like an original Game Boy. Yeah. And then he's programmed it so you can catch, you know, you can catch the Pokemon with the Pokeballs like you meant to. And he had to like, he went into like, he went into the original game and went online and figured out how like, all the kind of like the moves, not the moves work, but how much damage they do to d- different Pokemon and how actually c- catching a Pokemon works and the statistics behind it. So if they've got less than 30% health, this is what percentage you have of catching a Pokemon. And he really, really went into it. And it just looks absolutely, it looks fantastic. Like considering it's- he's made this in two weeks, it is amazing. Now, don't get me wrong. He's only covered like the first two towns and two routes in the game. So it's a very small portion of the game, but it's probably the, still the first kind of 20 minutes, half an hour of the game. And yeah, you know, he's just made it look absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I this wish is, this was um, real. This is my period of Pokemon. Yeah. And like the way that he's done it is, it's kind of like a reimagining in 3D because yeah. w- when you played it on the Game Boy, you had such a limited space of what you could actually see. I've yeah. never seen these levels laid out in this way where you can look further into the distance and see what's kind of what's going actually on. happening. Yeah, yeah. And that really appeals to me because you're like, right, there could be a Pokemon in that shrub area. There could be in this one. And also, I, you know, if he does the town maps and stuff, that's going to, he's look. done two of the towns. He's done Pallet oh, town lovely. and Viridian city, which are the first two towns and in, in yellow. And, but that's also like, you know, blue and red as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, you know, yeah. in yellow, there's like there's a few differences, but ultimately, it's the same kind of format. Yeah, it's the same. It's ultimately it's the same game. It's just slightly, you know, like you say, slight different Pokemon in them, different bosses, etc. Yeah, and then different. that fighting, not switching into the RPG battle mode and just having it within that 3D stuff. I think that's a really nice dynamic and kind of yeah. changing it. And um, I'd love to see this complete. I think 3D wise, the the characters aren't like the best, but how I think long it suits it. To me, it, it doesn't know. look at all like because yeah. in this article here it says, "Yeah, like Link's Awakening." It to look me, like it looks it. more like um, Minecraft. I'd yeah. say is what I think. Yeah, it, yeah, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't look like Link's Awakening. The only like comparison I would say is they were both Game Boy games, and one yeah. got poured, made into a Switch game, and now this one looks like it would be on the Switch. You know, if it, you know, obviously it's Nintendo as well. But yeah, I think he's just done a really fantastic job of it. Um, especially in that short time and i think like if if he did this that for me the perspective that it's in it would be quite cool with vr yeah like you know you, you're above it and you can see the whole area and then go in and walk around and like I think, yeah that would be pretty yeah. cool yeah uh, you'd just do it for a nice stroll in the afternoon wouldn't you ravi <laughs> oh yeah mate this is this is like out of all of the kind of conversions of like the zelda games and all of the stuff that I've seen, this one is one that I'd actually get and yeah, yeah. kind of sit down and get into because I've got those memories of it, you know. Yeah, but it is seriously impressive what he's done, um, you know, and he's claiming that he, he he did it in two weeks, which is just amazing. And he's really like, you know, he tells you like what issues they had. Like for some reason there was a, in the 3D model he made of, of Pikachu, there's a big hole in his head. And he was just like, I couldn't figure out how to get rid of the hole. So he just got a big per- big yellow circle and stuck it in the middle of him. <laughs> so he covered the hole. And like um, the Pokeball collision, like the Pokeball was bouncing around everywhere to a point when he was testing the game. At one point, he accidentally caught himself in a Pokeball. So the Pokeball bounced back and caught the character. <laughs> like, I guess this is in Unity as well. And it just kind of shit. Um, I, I think so. I think it is. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. It's on got that, that look. And, it's got uh, that look of it. Um, it really shows that these kind of, you know, game creation engines and stuff yeah, are just so, like, wow, so accessible that you can do this in a week. Yeah, exactly. So um looks absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, I don't think it will see the light of day for a playable demo. 
with, you know, the house of Nintendo. But yeah, go check out the video. It's picking up some traction on YouTube. Looks really, really cool. Yes, I'll stick that in our show notes as well, along with the rest of the stories. Now, we have got more to talk about before our special guest, Shelby, from Tech Tangents on in just a minute, including a video game that they started programming back in 1982 that's just been finished. So we'll talk about that in a second and something amazing for the Super Nintendo. Before that, though, of course, now we are uh, almost halfway through October, well, middle of the month now. That means there's only two weeks until our favourite weekend of the month, our patrons hangout that is coming up the last Sunday of every month. We all get together, have a bit of a geek out, have a bit of a call, like you always say, Ravi, like the Brady Bunch. We're all there on (laughs) Google Meets. Those little heads all chatting away. And this is just something that we offer for our incredible patrons. Now, a quick reminder that the reason we have a patron is just to keep the lights on for this podcast, make sure that we can keep bringing you an episode every Friday. You know, we've got big costs in doing this, you know, website hosting, audio hosting, all of that gets renewed in January, actually. So perfect time if you would like to support us on there. But of course, we give back as well, don't we, Ravi? Yeah, we totally do. Like, I I absolutely love our patrons. And the thing is, like, the moment you know there's a lot of people struggling and stuff so it's it's just amazing that you guys can support us and you know you help us do this podcast and keep it independent and keep it going you know um i, I was working out we've nearly done half a decade now of interviews every single week which is just insane so um we, half we, a decade we, pardon more than nearly, nearly a decade. Yeah, nearly a decade. decade. We were like nearly seven years in, Ravi. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's so long that we don't even know. But, um, yeah, without you guys, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And kind of, uh, it's just absolutely fantastic. Like, you you do get some amazing rewards as well. So you get an ad-free episode, which is on a personalized feed. So you can have that put into your um, podcast client. Then you get an ad-free episode and then you get a couple of patron stories as well. Extra on that one. And we make the interviews a bit longer as well. So you get a little bit of extra content and then you get our after hours podcast, which um, is crazy. You know, we talk about all sorts there. We've been uh, reviewing games recently, which has been really nice. You know, our our listeners have given suggestions for that. And um, we've been able to find some titles that we've never explored and looked at before. But also... There's the after hours, there's the meetup as well, which um, Dan was saying, you know, that's absolutely fantastic. And uh, it's like a little club and we sit around and have a beer and, you know, talk about really obscure stuff. Uh, what's the difference between an ostrich and an emu? Was <laughs> one of the reasons. <laughs> That took up way too long on the last patrons hangout. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we give you all sorts of stuff for being a, a backer of this show. And of course... You get welcomed on the podcast for joining us on Patreon in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, and that is the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And let's welcome our latest members. Hall of Fame! A big thank you to David Burgess. Brett Alexandra. Andrew. And Timo Hanpa, who all joined us on Patreon over the last week or so. Massively appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join the Retro Hour Patreon community, all the details are on our website at theretrohour.com. Now, we're going to be talking to Shelby from Tech Tangent in just a minute. Tell us about this, though. This looks pretty cool. Elden Ring for the Super Nintendo. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been pulling out all the fan remakes and demakes uh, this week. Um, you love it. You love I do, a good I do love them, and I do love Elden Ring. I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, came out, I think it was February this year now, and I, I played it to death for about four or five months. Um, so this comes from 64 Bits Animation, who I think we've discussed a couple of their, their kind of like creations in the past. So this isn't a playable demo or playable game or anything like that. This is an animation as it stands. Um, and they, they've done a few games already if you want to check them out but this looks like this is right up my street so you know you guys know i'm the console boy and i definitely love my rpgs for the super nintendo and this looks you know obviously it's elden ring which has been a huge phenomenon i think it's sold 20 million copies since it's come out in february now um and i think it's got a near perfect score on almost you know every like you know um media outlet in terms of reviews and stuff but this looks it just looks like in the exact same vein as like Secret of Mana, Secret of Evermore, um, a lot of those kind of like action RPGs for the Super Nintendo. The attention to detail in terms of like the Super Nintendo style of it, they've even got the um, the Mode 6 graphics when you're on the world map. So in Elden Ring, you 
you travel around the world map like on horseback um but like the whole world is like one world you go into caves you go into castles like you know obviously it's on next gen so there's like hardly any loading screens and all that and how they've done this is that they've made it very very much like those old games like final fantasy and stuff so there's the world map which is in the mode six and you walk around on your horse and then you you go into you know dungeons and castles and stuff like that but when you're in there they have captured the essence of like these these kind of like mid 90s square enix games like chrono trigger and stuff i'm listing so many of them now they've captured that so perfectly but made it so perfectly elden ring with all these iconic bosses which are in there um like melina um Elena, i can never remember her name um they're, they're all there all the big baddies from it um, the dragons everything the animation it looks absolutely amazing and if this was to come out you know, as an actual game, I'd, I'd be buying it right now. Like I'd be slapping my card down. <laughs> to well, get this um, of- uh, one thing is it's, it's mode seven. <laughs> is it mode seven? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did I say mode six. Yeah. Jeez. Thanks Ravi. <laughs> it, it's all right. But um, that's a graphics mode that we don't really see in a yeah. lot of, in a lot of D makes and stuff. Um, I, I think this looks really impressive and like they are using hell of a lot of graphics effects and like looking at it, I'm like, is this actually going to run on the snares? You know, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it'd actually run. Like I say, it is an animation that they've made. But, you know, we've covered a few of these in the past, you know, these animations and these demakes, you know. Um, but they always just look absolutely beautiful and stunning. And just, like I say, the, those labour of loves, one of my many, many sayings. Um, but yeah, it just looks absolutely amazing, this. So is that available for people to play then, or is this just... No, uh... so you can't play it. Right. It is just an animation as it stands. Um mm. But it just looks really awesome, and I wish it was real. Oh, the teasing is so much. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Make some games we can play that look amazing. I know. So, uh, yeah, if you're doing to check it out, though, it does look very cool. I'll put that in our show notes as well. Now, obviously, making a video game, I imagine it's, you know, it's quite a time-consuming process. This has got to be a bit of a record, though. A text adventure <laughs> that was started back in 1982 has finally been finished. So how's about that? 40 years in the making. Now, this is a text adventure game that's called Ferret. And it's got a really interesting history because no one really knows who's made this game. And it's a bit like, because you know me, I love my adventure games. And For, I do love I a good text you were adventure. Say, I love ferrets. <laughs> yeah. no, got, well. I, I, I trousers, gonna, no. That's a, a, an old uh, Yorkshire <laughs> tradition, isn't it? Yeah, o- only on Sunday. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this is a game that's a bit like, if you ever played the older Infocom adventure games or, you know, games like Zork, yeah, that kind of yeah. thing. Well, it was a team of programmers who worked for a company called um, Data General Software. So Data General, I think they did like mini computers back in the late 70s, early 80s. They basically decided to make a little game just so they could play it internally. So apparently the, ga- the game's name, Ferra, was um, some office slang that they used to use and really, you know, to ferret around for something, you know, to find something. Apparently that's what it meant. But they started working on this, but obviously hardware kind of developed. But the thing is, it could only run. It's written in a programming language called PL1, um, a language produced by IBM. And it doesn't use an interpreter or anything like that. It runs as native code, originally only on these machines that they had at Data General back in the day. So obviously that kind of limited it to, you know, a subset of hardware that most people didn't have. But over the years... They kind of upgraded it and um, ended up releasing an MS-DOS version of the game. But then, <laughs> this is in like 1990s, I think Data General were, was sold to another company. And now they've basically released it to the community who've taken it on themselves to add more to the game and actually release it in a finished form. Because the way the game was made initially was that it was modular so people could add new code and new sections to the game. So meaning that now 40 years later, we've got something that some people reckon could be the biggest text adventure game ever made. Yeah, it's so this thing is huge. It sounds massive. And like, I, I find that really interesting that obviously it's, it's really early and it didn't have an interpreter, but that language, I've never heard of that as well. You mm. know, um, yeah, this, this does seem huge and that kind of modular thing, being able to keep it going. Um, it's 1,785 rooms. 
3,449 objects. And there's an article on PC Gamer, and they compare it to the original Zork game. <laughs> Zork has got 110 rooms and 60 objects. Okay, so, so, you know, people used to map out these things, <laughs> draw them. Yeah. I can imagine <laughs> maps getting absolutely giant for this. Um, yeah, it, it sounds interesting. And, like, you know, all the items that you can collect as well, thousands of objects and stuff. And uh, I can imagine how, how complex this is going to get. This is going to become the ultimate um, speedrunners game, isn't it? Yeah, well, it'll probably take you 40 years to speedrun this game. Yeah. The size of it. But again, it's one of these, you know, these old school text adventure games, and they don't hold your hand. Oh, no. They can no, be pretty not brutal. At all. Yeah, I, I remember playing um, uh, Colossal Caves in uh, one of the museums, mm. and I, I literally had to have a guy who would just walk past me in the museum, and he'd be like, you know, collect the bird <laughs> and just walk off. Yeah. And I kind of needed those tips, and I was really getting into it. But yeah. They also had written maps and stuff. So I can imagine if you're an enthusiast, this is just going to be like heaven. Yeah, and you can download this to run on Windows. Every article I've read about it, it says that, that apparently it will trigger, and I'm not quite sure why, but apparently it triggers um, antivirus software. If you, if you think it's, it's uh, probably going to be as low level, um, yeah. that it's the antivirus software is probably going to see this as like, this is code that can, you know, change your hardware or it's going to recognize it something and also it's probably an exe as well and anything on a on an exe is um you know seen as seen as a bit dodgy or maybe even the word ferret might be <laughs> put in a register there might be a ferret virus somewhere but um yeah i've, I've found hopefully hopefully there's not like some old school virus from 1982 lurking in there when it ready to be released on the world yeah i i think um I found that with a lot of retro titles and stuff, actually, that now when you are trying to run them in Windows and stuff, you've got a whole layer of like, you know, mm. remove this protection, tell it that it's not a virus. Are you sure you want to run this potentially dangerous software? Yeah, um, I pretty much do that every day. <laughs> yeah. Although someone has actually made like a minimal download version of it that apparently will not trigger antivirus. So oh, that's nice. on Google and Drive I bet, that, I bet you there'll be a web version at some point, you know, uh, that yeah, you'll be able to play like in Chrome or something. Yeah, text adventure games are not, not that demanding, are they? So, uh, yeah, that's a good shout. So it does look very cool. I must admit, I'm quite curious. It does sound like the kind of game where I can't imagine I'd ever see more than, God, 0.5% of it, um, not having the, the really much patience for it. Although, interestingly, there are some kind of um, blogs and stuff. I've been looking through a few of the comments on this as well. There are a few people that there's one guy's making it his mission to kind of play through every text adventure game in the world. And he's on with this one right now, and he kind of documents the process, and you kind of watch him play it. It's it's so, um, his task I'll, has paused for a, a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the next four decades. So, yeah, if you're doing to check it out, I do think that's amazing. I mean, that's got to be a record, surely. There can't be many more games. I mean, I thought Duke Nukem Forever took a while, but <laughs> never mind, forty years. So, um, if you want to check that out, I'll, I'll link it up in our show notes, along with the rest of the stories. You don't have to Google around. I save you the job every week. I put them in your podcast app in the show notes, or you can head to our website at theretrohour.com. Now, I love it here in the UK at the moment. I think it was dark tonight, around 6pm. You might even be uh, cosying up with your, your blankets on on the couch. I got Dominic Diamond's book. I've been reading that. I do love a good book this time of year, just staying in, keeping warm, by the fireplace with a good book. And of course, our sponsor, Bitmap Books. They do the best retro gaming books, don't they? Oh, beautifully presented books. Like... Um it just works of art when you get them. I, I really love the Bitmap books. And, you know, this book that we're going to be talking about today, we've actually had the guest on, the, you know, the guy who created this book. And it's, it's a really interesting subject, The Secret of Mac Gaming. Um, and this 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 book, you know, talks about some of the, like, you, you think of the titles that actually came out uh, on the Mac, some of the biggest franchises in the world, you know, Myst, Halo, SimCity, came out on the Mac yeah. and it's not a system that you traditionally kind of associate with gaming, but actually it's got a huge gaming history. Yeah. And we had Richard Moss, the author of this book, who is um, an award-winning journalist, a game historian as well. And this book, The Secret History of Mac Gaming, it's a new expanded edition of it as well, containing around 80 interviews with key figures from that era. And of course, covering all those games you mentioned and lots more too at 480 pages long. Of course, like all of Bitmap Books books, some really eye-catching, gorgeous colour graphics in here as well. And there's even a foreword by the seventh guest co-author and uh, id software legend, Graeme Devine, in here as well. So, Well, recently we saw Dana stroking an apple pippin in Norway, 
And uh, <laughs> yeah. also, you know, they, they look at the shareware heroes as well. And there was a lot of kind of shareware software that came for the Mac when it wasn't massively supported by Apple. And, and that was just like really fantastic. And uh, some great titles came out on that as well. So check it out. Yeah, so if you didn't think the Mac was a gaming platform, uh, this book could definitely open your eyes. The Secret History of Mac Gaming, the new expanded edition, you can check it out right now. And the rest of their retro gaming collection, show our sponsors some love. You know, they've been massive supporters of our show. And uh, treat yourself to one of their books. You can check it out right now, bitmapbooks.com. Right, the next, we're going to be chatting to one of my favourite YouTubers, Shelby from Tech Tangents, is coming up next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for our favourite bit of the show when we welcome on a very special guest. Now, we talk to so many different people on this podcast, people who were involved in the creation of the video games and computer industry, people around the companies, people that made the games, and I love talking personally to other content creators because, you know, getting on like-minded people and this common experience, this passion that we all share, it just makes for a really enjoyable conversation. And today, it is my um, absolute honour to welcome someone who I've watched on YouTube for several years now and is actually one of my favourite YouTube channels. And I think, actually, everyone needs to check out Shelby's channel if you haven't seen it already. Obviously, I'll link it up in the show notes. But let's welcome on this week's special guest, Shelby from Tech Tangents. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hello. Great to have you joining us. Now, um, we are going to talk about your amazing YouTube channel. But before we do, I mean, it's always kind of nice to get a bit of background on our guests and find out, you know, what, what got them started on their journey. So if you can recall, I mean, do you remember your first ever computer experience, kind of where it all began for you? Ooh, computer experience. Well, first one, that's kind of an interesting one. Uh, I had been given a Compaq Persario laptop um, this was been like Pentium two era. And that was my first computer that was mine. And mm. I, <laughs> it almost immediately died on me. <laughs> it was so frustrating. <laughs> um, and somehow through just random luck, I was also given a Dell Inspiron 3500 right after that. It's basically same era computer. And, uh, that kind of, was that was the one that stuck with me and was the computer that I got to use and really learn on. And I did everything you could ever possibly imagine to that thing. It was, um, <laughs> I, I still have it. It's actually sitting in another room, uh, next to me, completely destroyed. The hinges are gone. I don't even know where the LCD is at this point. Uh, some of the keys were ripped off of the keyboard, but I had the dock to go with it. So as it decayed over the years, I continue to use it through the Dell dock on it. And uh, on that thing, I I wrote bash scripts. I played games. I learned that you cannot copy the System 32 folder from Windows XP and put it over the Windows Th System 32 folder in Windows 98 and get plug and play support. It <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that was it. All 1.1 gigabytes of uh, storage on that was pretty much dedicated to gaming of that era. And yeah, that, that was kind of where it got started for me. And I imagine that's a little later than you might have expected for me. <laughs> but I, I kind of had a late start in this stuff. Well, you mentioned about yeah, you know, doing I, bash scripts and that kind of thing on there as well. I mean, what kind of got your interest in exploring that side of computing then? Where, where did that kind of come from? Well, that, that was a, that was kind of bore out of it being not the best performance computer. And it was just something where I wanted to try and eke out every bit of performance. This was something I perfected over the years uh, for underperforming laptops where I could have a bash batch script that would allow you to like kill Explorer and uh, Internet Explorer, all the other background tasks, and then just launch the game with as minimum CPU resources being utilized by other software as possible. And then the game could have everything on the system, but still run in the Windows environment. Um, and then once you'd close the game, it would use a wait command or something, and then uh, it would fire everything up in the background. And uh, that way you could have the best uh, possible experience and then i would use it for automating file management and stuff like you know say you encounter a bunch of zipped files that you want to be unzipped i would have a batch script that would try and unzip all of them different things like that you know it's remarkable to think you know when we use retro systems today 
I think we get a bit spoiled by using stuff like, you know, SD cards and compact flash cards. You mentioned your machine there had like, you know, what would it say? One gigabyte hard disk in there. And I remember even yes. when I, I think my first, my first PC was something like a yeah, two or three gigabyte one, my first actual like Windows PC. And I remember thinking mm. that's an infinite amount of storage. I'm never going to fill that. But of course I did a few months later. Oh man. Uh, storage was always a challenge on that thing. I, I think I, I can't remember if I had the floppy drive for it or not, but it did have USB ports and I had a 128 megabyte flash drive. And that was the key to the city. Um, on it, mm. but I, it also it did have an optical drive built in that I eventually upgraded to a DVD drive <laughs> in a Windows ninety eight laptop, which was just hilarious. But uh, I I would mostly load software onto it off of uh, CD, and then I would sneaker net stuff back and forth with the flash drive. But yeah, no, one gig was not a lot. <laughs> Do you remember? Did you ever like burn CDs? And um, I remember using Nero. Uh, and actually, I couldn't do anything else on on my Windows ninety eight machine when it was burning a CD. Otherwise, it would get like a a buffer underrun error. I had to leave it alone. Couldn't even use a mouse. Uh, on that computer, no, I, I wasn't ever able to burn CDs. But uh, I used that computer way too long, and I I was at the point where I would take uh, CDRs to my school that had a bunch of Pentium four Dell Optiplexes, and I would burn CDs at the school and take them home so that I could use them on the laptop to have more storage. <laughs> I was, uh, I'd, I'd abuse their school computers quite a bit. I'm glad it wasn't just me that did that. So I actually, <laughs> we had a, a suite, a suite of iMacs and I had them all running Napster and then burning all that to CD. I'd, I'd run it on an evening when it, no one else was in there. Oh man. That, that actually reminds me. I, I, when I was in elementary school, um, I was still taking, files to and from school on three and a half inch floppy disks because that was mm. I didn't have a flash drive at that point and then there was a school I ended up I don't even remember how I ended up in uh, some kind of multimedia class where we were editing videos and I used this really weird computer that I'd never seen before and it had like this really advanced graphical user interface and the software was all flashy and quick and I didn't know what it was at the time and it took me so many years after to actually figure out what it was I was using a g4 iBook <laughs> and at the time it just seemed like space age computer stuff going from Windows 98 ho at home on floppy disks to this at the school and it it was always really funny because in the back of my mind it was just this mysterious computer and now I think I have one somewhere actually but yeah it was just <laughs> nowadays it's like oh yeah it's it's that that's what it is that was my first experience of video editing digitally as well actually on a, I think it was iMac G3s or G4s we ran and trying to edit <laughs> on a timeline using that hockey puck mouse that oh. was the most comfortable thing in the world <laughs> oh yeah no we had to use the trackpad but it, it blew my mind when i was able to do stuff like chroma keying on it with probably iMovie mm. i don't i don't know what software it was exactly but yeah it was it was a very weird experience for me then well obviously on your channel i mean you do repairs and you know you, more recently actually one of your recent videos you actually designed a, a card to uh, resurrect an old cd-rom actually put the card together yourself following some instructions from a friend um, did you have any electronics or repair skills when you were a kid because you seem to know your way around a, a soldering iron pretty well these days well i'd always been keen to take things apart um sometimes i would put them back together <laughs> um, and it, it I never actually, I had an electronics, uh, like radio shack kit where you could like put resistors and jumper wires and things together to try and build a uh, circuit out of something. And it came with a book with a whole bunch of schematics on how to make all these fun projects. And I never used it once. <laughs> um, <laughs> that all didn't actually end up happening until actually not that long ago, probably 2015. 14, I want to say is when I really got into electronics. Um, I'd taken a job as a software developer for a local startup. I was tasked with doing SharePoint database stuff and it was just utterly brutal. I didn't, I'd been a Linux user at that point and I'd run my own personal servers and coming into this company and it's like, Oh, this is Microsoft, everything. It was awful. And while I was there, um, I demonstrated an aptitude for just learning things in general. And someone in the product development department there uh, had like, you know, asked me a couple of questions about doing C programming on a microcontroller. And I immediately knew the answers because that was much more my skill set. 
And I eventually ended up kind of shifting into the product development department there and working as an embedded systems engineer where you do both software and electronics. So I actually got mm. very familiar with how to build up a circuit and designing circuit boards and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, I actually worked on a lot of electronic stuff there. It was a really great learning experience. So that's how I kind of really cut my teeth on learning electronics was mostly modern stuff Um, because I found that it was actually kind of difficult to learn those types of skills like electronics and software stuff during the 90s and early 2000s era of computers because, I mean, you, you have a Commodore 64 from the early 80s. You fire it up. That's your programming interface right there. Basic. It's literally the first thing you can do um you get to windows 98 i mean maybe cubase looks buried deep down somewhere in there but you're not going to find that easily without being told specifically where it is and then windows 2000 or well windows xp i should say comes out and (laughs) there's probably no more basic in there at all batch files are basically it so it became really hard to tinker on that kind of stuff and that's part of why I've switched to Linux now, because it's so much easier to do those kinds of things in that environment. I, I feel like nowadays it's actually a lot easier to get into that kind of stuff, too. So I'm really glad that that shift has happened over time. But, yeah, it was it was difficult to learn how to do those things. I remember getting like a C++ programming book when I was really young and I wanted to learn that, but I didn't have a C compiler. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Cool. Now I I can read the syntax, but then I can't practice it. <laughs> yeah, trying to learn it without actually having it on your screen is a bit difficult, isn't it? Trying to learn C in your brain. Yeah, yeah. It, it was really <laughs> frustrating because it's like, well, how do I actually do this? I'm like, here's the book. Like, okay, now what? It's like, I looked up C programming on computer and it's like, oh, I need to buy Visual Studio. I need this multi hundred dollar program just so that I can follow along this book. No, thanks. Yeah, you're right. I mean, computers in the 80s, yeah, they dropped you into generally basic. So you, you were encouraged to tinker with it and start programming. But like you mentioned, that you know, when, when computers became more of a, a commodity device, I suppose, that was kind of taken away. And you really had to drill down and want to find it, didn't you, or be able to afford the software? Yeah, no, it, it's a totally different experience to try and do that stuff. Like, I actually still have this, like, desire to write software for Windows 98. I actually have... Uh, Visual Studio uh, C++ 6.0 right next to me um, because I still have this dream to do that. And I I have installed it on one of my computers and compiled one of their DirectX uh, demo programs. It's like one of these days I want to actually make it happen. But yeah, you have to go out and you have to get something for that era and beyond. And it's just really disappointing because it really makes it harder to get in it at entry level and learn how to do that stuff when you could before, but, and there's no reason it couldn't be done now. It's just like that. Well, did you use computers much in school? Were you taught them there? And what was kind of your experience? <laughs> um, I generally actually tried to use computers as little as possible in school because I was always so far ahead of the curve that everything they were teaching was completely pointless. Uh, yeah. I remember middle school, it was, it, the computers were still barely being implemented there. I mean, they might, they, there was a typing class. Actually, I do remember this. Uh, there was a typing class uh, where there was uh, Mavis Beacon teaches typing going on. And I was atrocious at that. I was hunting peck. I, I couldn't, I couldn't be bothered. I actually ended up, I think getting a pass on that. Oh no, I remember that now. Uh, when I would get like reviewed for grades, I would suck at typing. Like the teacher would watch me type. It'd be terrible. But I remember uh, I s- figured out how to scam the software. It would not count misses on the particular version that we were using. And you could just it, there was like one particular typing game where it would show you like a constellation and then it'd be like, oh, press this key. And then you'd press, you know, that key. Then it showed the next key and then you'd press that key. And there would only be a couple of keys because it'd be trying to teach you to keep your fingers on the home row. But if you just sat mm-hmm. there and you spammed all the keys on the keyboard, um, it would eventually just pass you (laughs) it wouldn't count all the (laughs) keys that were wrong so i cheated my way through that um and then when it came to like final exam it just i failed miserably but yeah after that it was you know like there was a computer class i was like oh here's how you use the office suite and word and powerpoint like okay that's not really computers that's learning how to be a microsoft employee okay um and then 
high school comes around, there was a computer class. This is actually, this is one of my favorite stories. Um, there was a computer class there. And at that point, um, I could do whatever I needed to on a computer. I absolutely was just totally fine and comfortable with them. Um, and I was like, I want to, I went to the, the class administration office, however, whatever it was, admissions, I don't know. Um, and I told them I would like to test out of the computer class. And they were like, mm. really? We, I mean, I guess you could do that. We've never had anyone do that. And like, yeah, there's just no reason I need to take this class. So I got a schedule done to go test out of the computer class. I I go in there, I meet the teacher, I take the test and I get a hundred percent because it was all like really trivial stuff, like learning how to do copy paste. It was just Mm. ridiculous. So I I finished the test, get a hundred percent. Teacher's like, yeah, you really don't need to take this class. And then they're like, you know, I have this computer that has a problem. Uh, and I was wondering, could you like look at it? Maybe you know what's wrong with it. I'm like, sure. So I go over there and it is a Dell Optiplex from that era, Pentium 4 kind of thing. And uh, I open it up and it has two RAM bus Terminator sticks in it instead of actual mm. RAM. So it's just blank PCBs in the RAM slots. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it doesn't have any RAM. That's why it doesn't work. And then I left. And that's when I knew, okay, yeah, that definitely would have been a waste of time for me. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you could actually teach the class better than the teacher, I think you probably know that you don't need it, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But that, that was pretty much it for computer stuff and public education. Well, were you much of a gamer growing up? And um, I know I've seen videos of um, Revolt Stunt Arena on your channel, some of your very early videos on there. And what kind of titles shaped your tastes in video games? Oh, video gaming's interesting for me. I'm definitely, uh, I don't know that I would call myself a gamer, but I really enjoy video games. Um, I was always all sides on gaming when I was growing up. Uh, So I had lots of consoles um, and I also played PC games. It was kind of one of those things, you know, why not both? So a lot of it was the the first party titles for stuff. So, you know, Super Nintendo would be Mario World. Uh, PlayStation comes around, really loved Crash Bandicoot and Spyro. N64 can't beat Super Mario 64. But uh, I also played a lot of PC stuff and... Uh, the there's really weird titles that stick out to me that I played a lot. Like, uh, and there's one I'm actually here that immediately comes to mind. I'm still trying to get a box copy of wacky races, uh, which was based off of the Saturday morning cartoon. Um, I played pod a lot on PC. It's just a wide swath. And, uh, you'll appreciate this. Um, uh, cause I've listened to some of your guys' podcasts and I've had a Jaguar when it was new. Oh, wow. And, uh, still have it. And actually have uh, a fairly reasonable Jaguar collection as a result. And uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I have a Jag CD <laughs> that is mostly from that era. Uh, but yeah, no. So I, I, I played a bunch of stuff. And yeah, generally, I've never really restricted myself to one platform. And it's, it's just what kinds of games it is. You know, if it's a fun game, I enjoyed it. But yeah, so I, I played a lot. And I'm definitely someone who likes to have the physical examples of the game. So I really, I, I did play a lot of emulation, but I don't do it that much anymore. Generally, if I want to play something, it's a deliberate experience that I'm trying to have. So I'll pick out the actual console, bring out the actual game and play it. But yeah, so yeah, growing up, it was it was everything. <laughs> Where do you stand on stuff like flash carts? Because to me, that's a good kind of halfway house, you know, for a console. They are really, really handy, uh, especially for handhelds. I, I, I love them for handhelds because you can't take your entire game library with you without it being super risky. So uh, I have I had a lot of flash carts for handhelds. Um, I haven't purchased any of the modern flash carts, uh, actually, because this is I, I had a cheat code for getting games for consoles i did it over a decade ago when they were dirt cheap so right. <laughs> I, I have most of the games that i want for consoles at this point so i i haven't bothered getting uh any of the modern flash cart type things one of the ones that i regret i may actually go back and get is a like a, a harmony cart for a 2600 because I, I really like those systems and i feel like that one in particular would be really nice to have but 
I, I don't have a problem with people buying those or utilizing them. And I don't think it invalidates the experience at all to have that. Um, it's because it, it, as someone with a lot of games and collection type stuff, it takes up an enormous amount of space. So if you want yeah. to have that original experience by playing the original hardware, um, but you don't want to waste, you know, an entire room <laughs> to that, uh, having a flash cart makes a ton of sense. And I think being able to play games that maybe didn't come out in your region as well, like, uh, you know, I've been playing some some of the Japanese shoot 'em up games on the Sega Saturn, that kind of thing, you know, stuff that either isn't available in my market or would be extortionate prices to import them on eBay. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that for sure. Um, I, I don't have a, too many import games that I enjoy. Um, the shoot 'em ups I've always found a, a little hectic for my tastes, um, but I could definitely see, yeah, I know there's a ton of those that are in japan and that area that people have to import and especially on the specialty systems like the sharp 68000 um it it does make a lot of sense to be able to use like uh on the dreamcast let's say i think there's a lot of them on there the disc drive emulator for playing rips of those uh makes a ton of sense i'm currently trying to import games uh that are ones that weren't released domestically like i just imported a copy of hydro thunder for pc uh which i believe was only released in the uk for some reason um so i imported that recently and i'm now going to be going after uh some gremlin interactive games from there as well but yeah i actually uh (laughs) i i get a bit excessive when it's something i really want and uh I imported a Japanese Nintendo 64 and uh, all the accessories. I actually have a complete boxed everything uh, Nintendo 64 from Japan, Uh, partially because it has just some of the absolute best console box artwork ever, uh, period. Hands down. It's these gorgeous like neon lines on a dark blue background. It is great. Uh, But I bought it specifically so I could play the Japanese... uh, Shindu release, if I remember correctly, that's the name for it, of Super Mario 64 just because it has Rumble Pack support. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you just cover the buy it now price and just click the button? Pretty, pretty. Well, actually, because yeah. I bought it a long time ago, uh, it, it wasn't that expensive. I think I paid $150 to ship it and import with everything total. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, yeah. it was. You don't get those prices now, do you? Yeah, no, no, no. You're not going to. You're lucky to find the console bearer for that. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned about, you know, PC gaming and obviously being a PC gamer, that's always been filled with hardware upgrades. I mean, did you do much of that back in the day? I mean, were you investing in like, you know, voodoo cards and that kind of thing? I didn't end up doing a lot of that myself because I was too young to make the purchases and my personal computers were laptops, but um, Mm. I'd always tinkered with hand-me-down systems. So I, I would, you know, extract out the different bits of hardware that I could get and try and build some kind of monstrosity out of it. Uh, so I'd, I'd done that. Um, and some of my earlier videos actually feature uh, a computer that was built in an in-win Q500 case. And that was that computer. I, I still have it. I'm looking at it right now is kind of the computer that I've always had around me for Windows 98 gaming. And it's evolved over the day uh, the years and it does have a voodoo 3 so i did actually at some point get my hands on a voodoo 3 and i pu- put that in there um i <laughs> I'd, i wanted so much hard drive space in that computer but i didn't have access to really big hard drives because it was all scrap hand-me-down systems so i i would put you know all the maximum number of hard drives in there i could on the motherboard controller and then i ended up finding a pci uh ide controller and i put two more hard drives in there and they were like 60 gig hard drives, 30 gig hard drives. It was nothing. Um, and then I, I maxed those out because uh, I was still, I was actually collecting games through different means. I would get like jewel case games from Goodwill, that kind of thing. It wasn't really like a big thing. It was mostly just like I wanted the games um, and I maxed those out. And then I gutted an external hard drive enclosure and mounted that inside and connected it over USB to get, Oh, wow. more storage in there <laughs> so i bet you could hear that it, machine from the end of the street all those hard disks in it oh absolutely yeah all those really tiny hard drives um so yeah i'd oh, i'd been on the more hack job side of computer upgrades when i was really young but it, it has always always been tinkering with the hardware yeah 
You have to make do with what you can get, though, don't you? Yeah, it's a yeah, yeah definitely. It's it's a very different experience now, which is really weird. Um, trying to get this stuff, like I still, yeah, I don't I don't see as much hardware like that that you can really go through and experience now. Computers have become too simple. You get motherboard, CPU, graphics card, power supply, you're done pretty much. So it's a lot harder to do that now. Well, you mentioned that you're mainly a Linux user today on your main machine. I mean, when did the change from Windows happen for you then? And why did you want to leave Windows behind as your main daily driver? Oh, that that is very easy, actually. And I can almost pin, actually, I could pinpoint it to literally the exact date um, if I looked it up here. But I was, uh, I used Windows Vista on an HP Pavilion with a Core 2 uh, era Centrino processor, and it had a 9600 GT graphics card in it. Um, and on win- with Windows Vista on that machine, it was one of the worst computer experiences I'd ever had. And it got to the point where I would plug in a flash drive, and it would blue screen. <laughs> it was <laughs> sounds like Vista. Yeah, yeah, it was miserable. So I was a day one buyer on Windows Seven. All right, I got an OEM copy. I installed it on the laptop. Oh, it was fixed. It was better. So I was using that and then the windows eight developer previews started coming out and i saw that they got rid of the start menu completely Mm -hmm. and i was like oh the talk is happening the tick tock good window release bad windows release (laughs) and it's like i'm not gonna suffer through windows eight and i'd been experimenting with using linux on other computers i had a netbook uh that i'd purchased to take to high school so that I could use my own computer through classes. That, that was a whole other thing that was great. And I'd put Ubuntu on there. And mm. at that point, I was like, I'm already getting Ubuntu experience here. And I'd actually started running a f- file server on old scrap hardware I had sitting around that was running Linux as well. So I was like, it's, I think it's time. Windows 8 was the thing that pushed me to just go all Linux. I was like, I, I don't want to be on the whims of what Microsoft is doing anymore here. So I decided just windows eight, I'm done. I'm out going all Linux and I didn't look back from there. So I actually, I recently, when I got the office, because I was going to be going from two locations, uh, I bought a new laptop for the first time in a while. And, uh, I decided for giggles, I would use windows for a month on it just to see what it's like now. And that experience taught me that I definitely need to still be on Linux. <laughs> yeah, I think Windows Vista and uh, Windows 8 probably were the best advertising campaigns for Linux you could you could ask for, I guess. Oh, absolutely. No, no, that was that was a terrible experience. It was and it was so resource intensive that I actually dual booted two installations of Windows on that laptop. One that had all like the regular drivers and everything, software, office, you know, all the stuff that you need to actually use a computer day to day. And then I had another one that was just completely stripped down for games so that I could get the best performance on it because it was such a hog for resources. I've been talking about retro systems. I mean, have you always kind of been into them and have you kept your collection throughout the years or was there a time when you kind of got rid of your old systems and rediscovered them? How did that kind of work? I have everything I've ever had uh, with a handful of exceptions, but generally I have kept everything. So I've never had a time where I have purged out systems. Um, There have been computers and uh, systems that stopped working that I got rid of just because I didn't need them. And I've thrown away some cases that I kind of wish I'd kept. Uh, I have two big regrets for things that I got rid of. One was a, it's a, in retrospect, you know, it's, it's like not actually that great of a computer. It's just some cheap system that I got. Um, I don't even know where, um, but it was a, like one of my first desktop computers. It was just a black case, very unimpressive hardware. I can't even remember what it was, but it came with, this was actually one of my first experiences with Linux. It came with Linspire installed on it. And oh wow, yeah, it is that. so hard to find that now, but uh, it was immediately replaced by Windows XP uh, by my dad. And I wish that I could recapture that experience, but that I got rid of a number of years ago because it was a black case, really boring, like two five and a quarter inch bays, really boring hardware. So I, I kind of don't, I, I wish I hadn't done that, but I don't have two significant regrets about that. 
The only thing that I've ever gotten rid of that I really regret was a 21 inch ViewSonic CRT that I hand put in a trash can because it had really bad ghosting that I now know was either just bad capacitors on the input board or the cable was just frayed internally. And if I'd replaced it, it would have been fine. <laughs> but, oh, wait, no, that one had a VGA port on the back. It wasn't a hardwired cable. But, yeah, so bad capacitors inside. But it was really bad to where you couldn't really read text on it anymore. But, oh, oh, I, I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> See, C- CRTs are becoming harder to find, I think, now as well, though, aren't they? It's, there was a time when oh. everyone just got rid of them, and now they're becoming a bit more scarce. It, it's worrying to think that they might not be around one day. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And the other horrifying thing is that, like, we see, you know, old systems, like a Commodore PET that has, you know, a monochrome monitor in it. You'll take off the back of the monitor. There's a handful of capacitors in there that's really easy to maintain and keep going. Um, same thing on, like, a compact Mac, you know. Um, but once you start to get into color CRTs, uh, the complexity ramps up almost exponentially. I have a couple of large CRTs that are color VGA CRTs that I want to use, but they're all dead in some different way. And every time I've opened one up to try and fix it, it is just like so ridiculously complicated inside. It's like, how, how do you even do this? So I have actually another 21 inch ViewSonic monitor now. Uh, thankfully, I was I was it was donated to the channel, and I'm so thankful for that uh, because it kind of filled a hole in my heart uh, for that other one. <laughs> um, and I was using it, and then it died on me. It has this whine that it gives off that's really bad, and then it stops syncing with some video signal. So there's probably bad capacitors in it. But every time you open up one of those modern VGA monitors, it's got hundreds of capacitors in it spread across like three different logic boards that fill up every side of the inside of the monitor. And they're just a nightmare. Like I'm not afraid to start working on something. And I look in there and I see, how do I even begin to troubleshoot this thing? Cause they're all interconnected. You have to undo so many different connectors to try and work on them. So the frustrating thing is, is I think we're not done seeing CRTs get thrown away as they continue mm. to decay because they are still very difficult to repair these ones for computers. Televisions are fairly simple. The dedicated monitors for older systems, fairly simple, but the Windows 98 and on era of VGA CRTs is just going to become really hard to find, I think. Yeah, because I've got a really nice Mitsubishi Diamondtron 21-inch CRT. And that died about probably about 10 years ago, but luckily a local TV repair shop fixed it for me. It was only a, a power issue with it, but I'm dreading the day that that dies completely just because it's oh, such yeah. a nice screen and getting replacements now is just getting harder and harder, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, actually, I really don't have that many VGA CRTs anymore. Um, I was recently sent a touch screen element that fits on a curved 17 inch CRT. And I was like, well, this is super cool. I want to put this on one of my monitors so I can try it out. And as I look through everything I have, I think I have one that it'll fit on. And I wasn't really, I'm not really looking forward to putting it on that one because that's the brand new one I unboxed for my uh, Windows 98 20th anniversary build. And I kind of didn't want to modify that one. So now I'm trying to keep an eye out for a 15, 17 inch monitor, I think is what it'll fit on that has a curved display because I have uh, several that are flat fronts, but they won't fit on there. So yeah, even I, I don't have <laughs> the thing that it actually needs to go on that. Well, we all know as you know, retro collectors that it can be quite addictive. I mean, how big is your collection and um, what are some of your prize systems then that you've got, would you say? Ooh, wow. Um, this is something I'm actually trying to figure out right now. <laughs> um, I have no idea what the actual number is, but I'm trying to create a personal wiki for myself just to know what all I've got going on. And I'm hosting it on my website and I'm from memory and photos that I've taken of some systems. So I scrolled back through my uploaded photo history, at least 107 computers. And that's unique individual systems, not like duplicates. And that doesn't count oh, wow. any generic beige boxes. <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah, so, but I still need to go through, like, I have a bunch of Apple systems that I don't know what are, but yeah, so it's, it's a lot, and there are a bunch of them that I've taken in that I haven't even had the opportunity to, like, try out, so I really, 
the part of that whole process that I'm trying to get through is like, I need to actually test and use and figure out what the condition is of every single one of these. So, uh, that's a thing, but my favorite systems, um, for PCs, it is 100% my tiny Pentium that I built. Uh, mm, it's yeah. so powerful. It's a Pentium one, uh, 200, 233. I can't remember which one the processor is, but it's a uh, really high speed Pentium with a voodoo two and a, now it has an all real vortex two with a, um, Oh my gosh. The, the MIDI adapter I have in there is escaping me. It is an, uh, a modern, wave table card MIDI device um, that goes on the all real. So internal, this computer is MIDI, it's sound, it's graphics, 3D, and it has CPU power. It's everything you need for like Windows 98 games and beyond. And it's about 10 inches wide, about 12 inches deep, and about three inches tall. And I have a nine inch or 10 inch color VGA monitor and it's pure VGA 640 by 480 only that goes with it. And the whole thing, the whole PC has all that power is the exact same size as a compact Mac. That's crazy. And it is hands down one of my favorite systems because it's just, it is everything you want for a computer like that in a shape that just doesn't make any sense at all. It is delightful to use for weirder computers. So I mean, weirder non X 86 architecture, um, <laughs> I, that's a little harder for me because I've never really had the time to sit down and use those. So like I actually have no history with Commodore at all, which I think is unusual for most uh, collectors. I've I barely have any functional Commodore machines at this point. Um, I see people in the UK who have like, you know, a room full of Commodore 64s or, you know, I was like, oh, I got a, an Amiga 500 and a 1200. It is so hard to find them where I am that I have barely any of them. Uh, I have two Commodore C64 C's and I think one of them works. It may have bad uh, CIA chips, so it can't connect to peripherals. Um, And I have a VIC 20. That's actually the first vintage computer I ever purchased uh, with the intent of it being a computer that I'm collecting that is in the box and dead. (laughs) The first time I tried to turn it on completely dead. Uh, I have to still figure that out. Um, it had a leaky cap for the main power input on it, um, and I tried replacing that <laughs> with a capacitor from a dead stereo amplifier, and that didn't fix it. It was like, well, that's the end of my electrical knowledge at that time. Um, so I it put it back in the box. I still need to get to that at some point. That would be kind of interesting. But realistically, my Commodore PET is the only functional Commodore uh, system I have, and yeah, it's I really like that system, but now that I'm thinking about it, um, my HP Series 80 stuff is definitely my favorite non-X86. Now that I'm thinking back through my computers, definitely that. The HP Series 80 stuff is very unusual. And um, I think most computer enthusiasts who remember for like games and stuff, they have no idea what those even are because they're science and engineering Mm -hmm. computers. And uh, they're basically designed to go next to all your lab equipment and control that stuff and display graphs and plots of those kinds of things. When you can use them in that environment, they are so good. But outside of that, they're almost completely useless. Like I have one of three games that were ever released for that platform. And it's just a bunch of stuff that HP released to demonstrate like the real time graphics capabilities of the machine. It's not like you're meant to actually play this. So it's, it's, it can't be that many of those in the world left today. Oh, the series 80 stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's really hard to say. Um, mm. The only other YouTuber I know who actually like collects that kind of stuff is curious. Mark who works at the computer mm. history museum. Um, and that's partially because he uses a bunch of HP test equipment with that computer. <laughs> So uh, he's doing that. And I'm kind of starting to build up that setup myself. I have an HP logic analyzer, HP power supplies, HP multimeter. And I'm trying to build up this uh, functional ecosystem of those things. But um, yeah, there, there's not a lot of them out there, I'd say, because they're they're so purpose made and slow for some things. Uh, their processor runs sub megahertz. It is like a 670 kilohertz processor speed 
but it has a ridiculous number of instructions per cycle because of the way that it works. It's kind of crazy, but it has operations built into the basic software that you wouldn't see in any other system uh, for a long time. It's like, it's actually, this is really interesting. It's one of the few computers that does not have a Microsoft derived basic. So Commodore's, uh, have a Microsoft basic that they licensed and then modified over the years. Uh, the same with the TRS-80 uh, line that went on, like is famously known the model 100 is one of the last systems that Bill Gates actually wrote code for. Uh, but the HP stuff is its own basic. And if you use it the way that it's meant to, it is one of the best experiences. I always love unique systems like that as well that are just like totally different from anything else you might be used to. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, on your channel, I mean, people can follow your, your progress with these machines and your amazing live streams that you do on Twitch as well. Um, one of my favorite videos that you did last year was when you got your hands on an Atari ST that I remember being quite a popular computer over here back in the late 80s and early 90s. What were your kind of initial impressions of, of that system then? And why did you add that to your collection? So that goes back to the video game console stuff i've always been very receptive to older systems so i actually have a lot of atari 2600s i'm trying to complete a collection of all the different hardware revisions of that um i have the 5200 both four port and two port uh the 7800 as boxed system uh with the european controllers thankfully and uh the jaguar as i mentioned so for me, getting the Atari ST was like the continuation of the lineage of that. And I actually have a bunch of almost all of the 8-bit uh, Ataris at this point as well. I think I'm just missing the 1200 XL. So I really like the Atari stuff. And it's always been like the ST is kind of similar to the Jaguar, although I, it, I can't remember if it was the Falcon. That's actually the same as the Jaguar or if the Falcon was more advanced, but they're very similar. Um, and I wanted to experience that. And this is kind of a, a larger thing here. I have a rule where I don't seek out computers. So everything mm -hmm. I have ever collected, I have either bought locally um, or had donated to the channel. So I don't generally import computers. The Nintendo 64 I mentioned I imported was the only system I've ever imported. And that was just because I wanted a, a specific import game. So it was basically what it was going to have to be. Um, and I think the only computer I've ever bought on eBay was a Toshiba Libretto 50 CT. And that's just because it's so tiny. But I generally don't want to ship CRTs because they just don't survive it. The plastic's too old and brittle yeah. and they no one packs them right. So it's just not worth the try. So I had to wait until I found an Atari ST locally. And that was only the second one I'd ever seen locally. So once I saw it pop up and not an astronomical price, um, like there's some Amigas listed on Craigslist right now, but that I would have to sell my car to be able to buy. Uh, <laughs> right. but once I saw that Atari ST, I was like, well, that's it. I'm getting an Atari ST. So I got that. Um, and then I realized just how little stuff I have to make it work <laughs> because there is just nothing around here uh for st like i can barely find uh computer games locally because most people don't collect those because they're enormous or you need weird hardware so they're really kind of despite being valuable nowadays they're still you know under the radar for the most part but uh, st stuff just doesn't exist so i'm pretty much reliant on what i can download as far as disc images and stuff like that so i've been trying to get that set up and then everything has failed on it since then the 1224 monitor had some caps fail in it so that doesn't work i actually have recently purchased the capacitors to repair that that will be a, a live stream at some point like you mentioned with twitch um i'll repair that um and then i can get back to trying to get the system going but i got it with the 31 uh for the 314 drive i'm not sure how what the general accepted way of pronouncing that is but the the half density drive the regular density drive yeah so I can't run most software on it. So uh, I've also been on the lookout to try and get the double density drive so I can actually use software because apparently it's like the 1.2 meg drive in the PC world where there's barely anything that was released that way. So, I yeah, I'm still trying to work towards getting the Atari ST to work, but uh, I need to get a monochrome monitor for it at some point because I really want to experience Cubase on it and uh, writing music through the ST because that was another reason I wanted it was it's amazing MIDI capabilities. I fascinated by all that. 
actually <laughs> kind of trying to build up like a 90s music production setup. So I have uh, the Roland SK88 that I did a video on. I love that thing. Um, I have the Roland MC303, uh, which is just a really generic music composition device that's mostly meant for like electronic dance music. Um, and then I have a Roland W30 which is uh, famous for having been used by uh, the Prodigy for doing a bunch of sampling stuff. And I really want to combine the ST with the W30 as a sampling type system where it can be uh, sequenced on the computer and then played back through the keyboard. Well, yeah, I know you've gone really old school on the channel recently because um, I saw you got your hands on an, an IMSI 8080. And, you know, War Games is my favorite film of all time. So when I saw that you unboxed one of those, I was like, my jaw dropped. So <laughs> what do you think about like the 70s microcomputer things? I know you've got a few of these in your collection now. Have you, have you had much time on the MSI yet? Uh, I have not uh, started on the MSI yet. So that's a whole process that I'm getting into um, where I'm trying to... Uh, this is Hopefully this is a video that comes out within the next couple of weeks or months, but I, it's so many projects going on uh, where I'm trying to come up with a solid way of reforming capacitors for old systems because you pop open one of those 70s computers and there are capacitors in there that are so ridiculously enormous and they cost like $50 per capacitor to replace. So it's like I want to give oh, this wow. thing the best possible chance it can to work when I do it. So I'm trying to lock down a process for bringing the system back up to life as uh, safely as I can. And that's the same thing with the, uh, the data generals as well is that uh, I want to make sure that I do that right. So trying to work through that. So unfortunately I haven't turned on the MSI or the CompuPro pro that I got with it. Um, but it will happen eventually. And both of those systems, I actually, it, they are so weirdly configured. Um, I'm pretty sure that whoever was using them had a bunch of different systems. I think they had like a whole office full of them or something. I'm not really sure because there's so much excess hardware that came with them. I think I'm going to have to basically tear them completely down, remove all of the cards and then just rebuild it with just what is needed to work. Because I think they put a bunch of extra cards in there just to store them. So I don't believe that they're turnkey as they sit. So I have to learn how to configure an MSI before I can even use it because it is so weirdly just crammed full of stuff right now. But hopefully it didn't come general, from NORAD or, uh, or somewhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I actually, this is, this is one of my favorite things when I buy uh, these old computers. I try and talk to the people because I want to learn the history of like, what, what was it used for? Why, why uh, is it being sold? You know, these different things. So the person, and I got some of the documentation that goes along with this. The person who's using the MSI um, was actually running a real estate business and they had apartment complexes that they were leasing out to tenants. And I have mm. a really big binder full of like every single address that they were in charge of. And they were clearly utilizing the M size as a billing system. Um, and they had multiple terminals as well that they had connected to most likely the CompuPro at that point um, for having probably accountants working through all of the data and I can just see how this computer was set up like it was a multi user system where they were keeping track of all sorts of different finances and things like that. So it was I, I can kind of tell what it was used for. Um, and it's really fun to do that. I also got I, I didn't really get into this in the video because uh, I didn't quite know what was there, but I got two hard drives with it that are just ludicrously amazing they are eight inch wide form factor hard drives um one of them i believe is 20 megabytes and the other one is 40 megabytes and they come in acrylic cases that are clear that are just like a slightly smoked brown but then the drives have been put into these beige metal enclosures and they're so boring and <laughs> i can only imagine <laughs> that those hard drives have the customer data on them but which makes me slightly happy because there's probably nothing on those drives that I need to try and recover. So I kind of want to like, once I have the system working, figure out what's on those drives, but then just take them out for display. Cause they're so pretty. I, I explored what they looked like on Twitter once, but yeah, they're, they're ridiculous. I bet they sound amazing spinning up as well. Oh, I, I have not had yeah. the dare. I have not dared to try and do that yet. Cause uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really hesitant 
to roast these things um, because stuff <laughs> like that, I, I, I got those computers for so cheap uh, compared to what they normally sell for. And anything that I would have to replace on them would cost more than what I spent on them. And I have mm. just so much going on that I try to avoid breaking really expensive things. So I, I don't have to try and hunt those parts down. And then they're rare, too, in, in that era. So, yeah, it's, I, I, I have not tried powering them up because I don't want to find out that they're broken. Like, actually, I found out in one of my live streams uh, the other day. Um, I Usagi Electric, uh, who has uh, the Centurion systems, he was uh, chatting in there and he mentioned he had a head crash. And I was like, you know, I haven't actually looked at the removable platter packs from my data generals to see if they've had that. And I shined a light in there and actually saw one of the platter plaque or platter packs has had a head crash, which is oh, really scary because those heads were considered re- uh, wear items. And I actually have the service logs for those computers and the heads had been replaced before. So ho- I'm hoping that the head had been replaced after that, but I don't know. So that's the kind of thing that I'm scared of finding out what happens. Like, oh, maybe there's this initialization process for the hard drive to protect it. And you need to do that. Or, and then I just fire it up to hear it for giggles and then it dies. So, yeah, And sometimes if you don't turn it on, then in your mind, it's still working. So you don't worry about it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, you, um, you resurrect hardware as well on your channel. And, uh, you know, one successful video that you did recently was with the um, CM100 CD-ROM drive. Now, I believe this was the first CD-ROM drive, wasn't it, for, for yep. personal computers? Yeah. And t- tell us about the experience and what happened there. Oh, that was just incredible. Um, so I purchased that drive. Uh, I mean, I can't even remember. I think it was 2021 now, which it, it felt forever ago. It's been a year and a half. I know that much. I figured that out for the video, but um, I'd been trying to find one of those for years, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, and I managed to luck into buying one on eBay for a very reasonable price, and it didn't come with anything. It was just the bare drive, and it's like, I know that it needs a weird card because it's an LMSI interface, and uh, I'm just going to buy the drive. I'll figure out the rest later. So I got the drive, um, and then in an unusual move for me, I actually powered it up, turned it on and put a disc in it to see if it spawned just because I want to know, like, you know, is it actually going to work? Is it worth trying to track everything down? And it did. It spun the disc up. So, huh, this will actually maybe work one day. I don't know if the laser's good because, you know, they might have it's it has a whole bunch of spray paint on it and etchings on it that it was used in the school. You know, it's very likely that it got used to death. Uh, And then they retired it and replaced with something else. So I don't know. I'm going to keep it and keep an eye out for cards. I'd had an eBay search that was a Boolean operation for like nearly every LMSI card. And I had multiple of these searches because I needed to filter out some things and none of them ever showed up ever. Uh, The only ones that ever showed up were either internal sound cards, which weren't usable. I thought because I didn't know what the way to connect to the drive was, or there was this one like, uh, to CM250 that's been up the entire time I've owned the drive. It's really ridiculous. They want $250 for this card, and it's like they took the pictures with a webcam from 1996 smothered in Vaseline, <laughs> so you can't see anything on the images. You know, if this is one thing that I really wish I could communicate to all the eBay sellers out there is like, if you take better pictures, you can ask more money because we'll be more confident that we're buying the right thing and we can see what condition it's in. But anyway, so there was a completely useless photo set um, and it was an internal card anyway, so it didn't matter. But uh, there were never any cards that were really affordably priced. So I didn't really have a hope of getting it working. So I was waiting for a card to show up and then one did as I recounted in the video and I bought it and then it didn't work. And I was like, well, this sucks because <laughs> apparently this thing's going to be a complete nightmare to get going. So I sp- knew about the drive from one video. This is how I knew that the drive even existed. Um, and then I'd done my own research and found out about it. Um, it's actually kind of interesting because the CM100 quote unquote is the first uh, CD drive, but it's, actually kind of not it is the deck rdd 50 that is the first cd drive but it's the exact same thing just rebranded so right it's it's that um although i've actually been contacted by someone who uh says that their father worked at deck and they're offering to lend me some what appear to be 
LMSI cards uh, that are prototypes for the PC. And what I'm getting from them is that deck may have actually been the one that created LMSI and they just sold the tech to Phillips. But I'm not sure. I got to I got to look into that more because I can't really find much about that online. But anyway, that's an, it, the, the CM100 research video is going to be just amazing. There's so much to get into. But I ended up contacting Roland, who had the video that was nine years old at that point. Um, and I had no idea if I was going to hear back from them and, you know, whether or not they would even be willing to share this information. But they were amazingly gracious and helped me uh, get pictures of that card, reverse engineer it. And that was a completely wildly different experience for me. Just reverse engineering a card from photos. <laughs> like I, I wish I had done something else first that I could tangibly hold to reverse engineer. But I, anything you can he, uh, handle yourself, you, you don't need to clone. You have one unless it's broken. So generally, you know, unless you're borrowing it from someone, you don't need to do that. So that was a very weird thing to do. It was like, I guess I'm never going to find this card. I have to make it from pictures. <laughs> and <laughs> it was that is commitment. like, yeah, it's like, I guess I'm doing this because I want to use this drive and I just don't see a path forward where I'm going to be able to buy this thing. And so I set out on Twitch to do it. And I as much credit as people give me for making that card in the comments, I can't thank my viewers enough on Twitch for sticking around for the weeks that it was just me staring at a monitor with a picture of a card and my editing or circuit design software as I just like draw a trace on the picture and then draw the trace in the uh, schematic software. It was to me really boring for video production, which is why um, I cut down all that so much in the actual video I released on my channel. I thought that video was going to do really poorly um, when I was publishing it. I didn't think that it was going to gain any traction at all. So the response to that whole process project has just been phenomenal compared to my expectations. But yeah, no, that was uh, (laughs) that was a project of necessity, not of really like, oh, I want to do this. It's like, oh, I have to do this. And the moment you get it working as well in the video, I was watching it. And then when it actually, you know, in, in DOS, you could actually see the drive that I was like, yes, actually, I felt your joy in that video when you got it oh working. My, the elation. It was <laughs> like, like I couldn't, you know, I, I don't really write drama into my videos. It's not what I do. But the I could not write even if I wanted to try something more like dramatic than that. Like I got the card working. Well, I think I have the card finish, I should say. And then the drive, you know, it seems like maybe it works. But then I try all of the different software drivers for this thing and none of them work. And then uh, one of my Discord members is like, you know, this one other driver that's technically not for this drive kind of mentions that it might work with that card. Um, and I, like, I try that as like a last ditch effort. And I, I so didn't think that was going to work. I wasn't even filming when it happened and then it worked. And it's, so I immediately went live so that I could actually do the tests on the drive and then it worked. And just the sheer luck of the software working, the drive working, the card working was overwhelming <laughs> because I just couldn't believe like, it actually all came together. The weeks of work on the card, the drive that actually received some shipping damage. I haven't really mentioned that, but it it got knocked around a bit when it was shipped. So like the fact that everything worked was just mind blowing. It was so amazing. Yeah. The stars definitely aligned for you that day. I think. Yeah, uh, absolutely. (laughs) Well, Shelby, I could talk to you all morning. Um, Such an interesting channel you've got. And I I think that's the reason why you're so successful as well. You mentioned that, you know, that video is already on nearly 180,000 views in like just over a week. And I think it's because you're covering this stuff that there's not really much more information out there. So I think, you know, being a a viewer of your channel and following you on this journey is just incredible. So everyone should definitely check out your uh, YouTube channel, Tech Tangents, and your uh, Twitch channel as well, which I'll uh, put in the the show notes of this week's episode. Um, What can we expect next from you then? Anything you're working on that's coming up on the channel? Well, uh, I have a couple of, I'm actually trying to buy myself some time uh, with the Twitch streaming uh, to try and make some videos through that now uh, so I can work on some larger projects. Um, 
I have a plan where I'm going to be making a video that covers uh, a bunch of different 3D stuff uh, for modeling um, on like 90s hardware that is popular. Um, and I'll I'll kind of leave it vague like that as a teaser. Um, but it's something it covers something that was most people's first experience with 3D graphics on PCs. Um, and I'll, I'll well. 3D rendered graphics, I'll say that. Um, it's interesting. But uh, yeah, I have that. And then I'm <laughs> I'm getting close to, I say, finishing up a long-term project where I try and get people to understand how complicated CDs are. Like, I didn't intend to set out to be a channel that kind of focuses a lot on CDs, but I think it's going to end up happening. Because um, there's a lot of times where CDs are ripped in ways that don't make sense. And I want to try and mm-hmm. like put out the information there of how you rip CDs correctly. <laughs> so I've got a couple of nice. long-term projects like that coming up, but uh, yeah, it's, there's just so much stuff going on. <laughs> it's always wild what I can pick to do next from everything that's available. Well, Shelby, I'm really enjoying the channel, so um, keep up the good work and uh, we look forward to seeing what's next from you. And thank you so much for coming on and being our guest this week. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Likewise, it's been great. <laughs>